Good afternoon. This is Mark Burdett with the Clinton and Leader, and I am here with Brianna Warner, Communications Director with Kanawha County Schools, and Brett Fraley, who's over the Department of Transportation. And I don't know if I got that right, but I'll give you an opportunity to set the record straight. But thank you guys so much for taking the opportunity to sit down. And we know that the topic of um, what's going on up at the Elk River uh, bus terminal and we want to take the opportunity to give you guys a chance to let everybody know what's going on, what what the update is. But first, before we get into that, why don't you guys introduce yourself and let everyone know what you do for Kanawha County Schools. Sure. So um, I am Brianna Warner, the communications director, and uh, most people probably just recognize my voice from getting some of their bus messages or um, from snow day messages or things like that. But my primary role is just to make sure that um, both all of our target audiences, meaning all of our parents, our students, our staff, and the community um, get more information, um, get information that they want, that they need, clarifying um, what's going on in the school system and helping get the word out about good things. And then also making sure that there's factual information going out um, about everything that that touches our system. And Brett? Brett Riley. I'm the executive director of transportation for Kanawha County Schools, and I'm over the buses throughout the county. That's a big job. It is. I, I just was up at the terminal taking pictures that's a lot of a lot of yellow buses out there in that parking lot. <laughs> That's true. We have 194 total buses. We have 162 established routes, and uh, you know the shortage of leaving the, those other routes open. Now is that countywide or is that? That's countywide. Mm-hmm. And so I, I believe I understand that the Elk River or the Elkview Bus Garage is the largest terminal in Kanawha County. It is. Back in 1996, they eliminated the Kanawha City Terminal. And by doing that, that made them the largest facility. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I know we, we did a story, uh, I guess, last week is when things kind of came to a head with um, the shortage that you guys are experiencing of bus drivers up there. And so why don't you give us a little bit of an update on what's going on at that particular terminal. Um, so whoever wants to jump in or both jump in. Well, you know, we got the training process going on. And um, we've got two classes currently in training and getting ready to start a third. We've actually added one driver to the uh, LV bus garage, but unfortunately we've had a driver off on medical, so we're at a break even, which is better than a loss. Um, We think that we've seen the exodus stop or at least slow, especially for the oil and gas industry, because those industries will start to slow down and lay off. So, you know, um, as we see people complete the classes and our anticipation is hopefully three three will test for certification next week some of those slots will start to get filled so what do you guys really attribute to the actual shortage what 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 i'm sure there's a laundry list of factors but what are the kind of the top two or three that really stand out as what's the challenge the number one's pay um the national bus shortage is a national problem so it's not just a local oh, no. bus shortage. This no, no, is no. a national problem. You can check it out anywhere, uh, and it's going to need a national solution. I mean, I don't think that, uh, you know, on the local level, we're going to be able to make up the difference. Because if you look, t- typically somebody with a CDL, earns be- just a straight CDL, earns between thirty-seven and $40,000. Our bus drivers start at twenty-three. And if you watch the WVU game on Saturday, they were advertising for CDL drivers for 125000 Wow. And that was multiple advertisements over the course of the game. So money's a big factor at this point. Are there any other factors that um, – is it really – it is down to the almighty dollar is what uh, what people are looking at? I think so. I mean, I think if you really drill down into the root cause, you're, you're going to find out that money's – Money's at the base. Where do you think it needs to be? More. I mean, as far as what what, what does that equate to? Does it need what, what do you think the new baseline should be in order to that makes it easier for you guys to attract 
uh, bus drivers. Anywhere, uh, five to 10,000 above where we are. If you did the math and say there's 4,500 bus drivers in the state of West Virginia, I think that the state to come to that $37,000 mark would have to come up with $63 million a year. And I just don't see that being there. But now the federal government, on the other hand, may be a, a different issue. There's 458,000 buses that run every day for 26 million students. So, I mean, there's a huge, huge impact out there. I, as I was really thinking about this, because we all, uh, I think you guys need your due. Uh, I know the teachers got their due. But I remember I have very fond memories of my bus driver back as going to Elfview Junior High right? Uh, from Pinch. Um, it, it sounds like they are an, play an integral role in the daily life of a student, getting them safely from back and forth to school. That's an important role. It is, but, you know, that's true of all of our service personnel. I just don't want to say it's the bus driver, it's the plumber, it's the custodian, it's the cook. Uh, it's everybody involved in that team to get them to work. And uh, it is a community effort to get them to work. I mean, we have to rely on people not illegally passing the buses. This year's illegal bus passing survey on 33 states was 83000 a day. I, I saw that this morning again. That's the, I've seen that multiple times, and I just – the showing video of kids getting ready to step out and you got a car just flying through there. I, I, I just have never seen anything like that. It's, it, it's hard to, to really fathom. Cause you think we've got to protect our kids, uh, of anything we need to well, we hold do. dear and not, not you guys. I'm talking about the public out there. When you see a bar coming across and a stop sign and people slowing down and they continue to do their, their, their thing, it just blows my mind. We have to give the county their due. When I came here in 2014, there were 93 illegal passes. Last year, there were 13. I mean, we can't tolerate one, but that's a significant difference. Absolutely. When the rest, when I first started, there were 74,000 illegal passes. Now there's 83,000. So we kind of got an inverse relationship where that comes from. So what all is involved in becoming a bus driver? What, what, what does one have to do in order to even become one? Are there some things that they have to, minimum qualifications that they have to have? We have to be 21 years of age. You have to have a GED or a high school diploma. And there's 40 hours of instruction that's given to class, here in class. Um, you have to obtain your CDL, your P&S endorsement on your driver's license. Uh, you have to have 40 hours behind the wheel, two of those in the dark. And there's just a there's a progression of steps you have to go through to get qualified. And you're kind of thinking, you know, it's, it's a long, drawn-out process, but it's very necessary. You know, you think you're hauling anywhere from 40 to 70 students, and you're the person in charge. I mean, you know, not being properly trained could have some significant negative impacts. Now, I understand you have your own training, but are there things that they have to do? They have to do this training before they get to you guys, and you check that off, or we you do additional it. training. Do like in other words, do they have to go do that and at least get the minimum qualification? Those are all qualifications that we help them with inside the process. Okay, you know, as we were talking yesterday, you know. A lot of people, excuse me, may come and get a CDL, but, you know, we should be able to capture three or four years of driving commitment from that person. If they don't, then they should have to pay part of that process back. The training for a CDL license, and I was talking to our trainers today, just for the bus driving portion, it's about 6500 bucks. So there should be an obligation to the taxpayer because the training is free. The only thing you have to do is pay for your CDL, and then we reimburse you for that. So, you know, if you leave in two years, then you should have to pay us back. But that needs to be done on the state level. I mean, we don't need counties out there chasing individuals. It just needs to be if you join the bus driving class and you leave in a year, then you have to pay this much back. And that's not the way it is right now. It's not. There's there's no requirement to pay anything back. You know, there's a lot of counties that look at <clears throat> non-compete agreements. It's kind of hard to enforce if someone's doubling their income. Uh, it's easy to show hardship. Um, but if there's something there in that training process, I think that would help. At least it would help us understanding the flow of what we could expect people to come and go. So basically higher pay, um, more commitment from the drivers to stay to get the value that they're getting because you guys are bearing the cost and producing the training so they don't leave. Correct. Right. And that, that in order to get that change, that would be a state legislature 
type issue. I think as, so. As for as far as that's something that's uh, okay that's needed. Okay. Um. So. So where where things stand, I guess, with with regards to the Elk River. Yeah, I think one of the great things that just to add on is that a lot of people may not understand that this year we added in the Zonar software, um, GPS software. So Brett is able on any given day at any given time to track our buses to find out when they're um, making their stops, when they're pulling into school, when they're leaving school. Um, And that enables us to give a much better picture, not only to parents, but to also pick up... um, And, you know, do additional runs. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. If we need help with that equipment, we're um, software, we're able to see which bus can come help the most, um, you know, the easiest and who's closest and who has the capacity, who's running ahead of schedule, who's running on schedule. Um, So that's something that's being looked at every single day. Um, And it's, you know, I know that we're, we're hearing all the feedback we do, and I know that they're looking at it all the time trying to make constant improvement and our biggest barrier is just getting the drivers um you know skilled trained safe bus drivers on those runs and do i i'm assuming i i don't think i heard heard you mention but i'm assuming people have to pass drug test and all that sort of thing absolutely so, so is that is that a issue at all it's not a significant issue. You have to have a drug. You have to pass a, dr- a drug test. You have to have, to have a background check and things of that nature. I mean, that's a CDL requirement. It doesn't matter whether it's over the road or whatever. But uh, those are not significant issues. Let's not say they're not an issue, but sure, you know, they're not significant. So, with uh, I know specifically with Hoover and Elfview Middle School, I guess with the time change, can you guys speak to that? Because I know a lot of people. Um, are frustrated, you know, with the time, um, a little bit later than, than normal. What, what are some things are you guys looking into? How are you going to address that or, or just trying to get through it? What, what's the, maybe the plan there? I mean, I think that um, from the district perspective, Dr. During has said, and all of our board members have said, they're listening to everyone that's calling, that's writing, that's commenting, um, that's sending them messages. They hear you um, and they are, you know, willing and open to considering changes if they make the most sense. At the same time, what we know is that we would be in a worse situation um, if we were to have had the same bell schedule as we did last year. Um, Brett was able, when the board members and folks decided to make the bell schedule change, the benefit that a lot of people don't think about is that that means transportation has the opportunity to relook at every single bus run and to set it up in a way that works best for them. So it's not a system that's inherited and it's just been running that way for a decade. So you deal with it and you make it work. This was an opportunity to make things better. And I think that um, and they were, the issue is just, we're not in a place where we're staffed enough to run, to execute that plan, um, the way that it's designed to be executed. Yeah. And Brett, you can add if there's anything on top of that. One of the major things we ran to last year, whenever we combined everybody was overcrowding and by separating those, you know, in the afternoon, we don't have that overcrowding. And if you watch the parents drop their students off in the morning at the middle school and the high school, you know, that, that allows for those buses to bring them in together. Not all buses do, but uh, but in the afternoon, that wouldn't work. Plus, you had the elementary school that was involved in some of those runs. So we're not staffed properly. We would actually be 13 buses short to do that at those two facilities. And you figure 50 kids... I think somewhere we'd be at about 600 to 500, 600 seats short to getting students home. The only way you could do that under the old schedule is to, uh, you know, make two runs. You'd have people having to get on the bus at 530 in the morning, come down, you'd have to go back and get to rest. Some of the things we have done is, you know, we started adding transit buses, the bigger buses. Uh, You'll see more of those in the future. The driver shortage is not going to change. You know, it's not going to go away. It's not going to change. Um, and there are a lot of drivers that have been here 20 years, you know, and they're good people. And they're, they're working very hard to make sure that this is successful. 
that's not uncommon for them to be involved in a conversation on what we got to do to make this work uh, or reach out to the faculty to see if they have any suggestions. And, uh, you know, as a team overall, it, it's getting done and it will continue to get better. Is there any plan as far as I know, some, some folks are concerned about when it gets colder? Um, kids having to wait outside, especially up at Hoover where there's the outside gathering. Is there is there a plan in place or what, what can parents, I guess, expect to how that's going to happen when the weather does start to change? Well, I figure I'll give them a bus and they can get in the heat with Wi-Fi. That sounds good. They shared buses last year, and students stayed on buses until the school opened. This is not unusual. But when it gets cold, and this is something we mentioned, I don't have to ask downtown. I know the right thing to do is give those students a bus so that they have some heat. And as soon as the bus gets there and we get one empty, or we'll stage one if we have to. Well, it sounds good when you give kids Wi-Fi, man. They, in a warm place, they'll be okay. Well, we don't want them out in the cold. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that, you know, that goes for our principals, too. I know that, you know, when when some situations have happened over the past few weeks, um, you know, the principal over at Elkview Middle just said, send anybody that needs to in here. I'll work it out. We'll provide them, you know, a, a warm place, a cool place to sit, to stay. I mean, we're all, you know, most of us are parents. We're all, um, you know, we care about the kids. So we'll find a way to get it done. And I think that's credit to everybody well before we close the most important thing is i guess to deal with the driver shortage how does one uh, go about applying for that position so the first step in the process is to go to our website at the top of our homepage. you will see the employment tab if you go to employment you'll see a listing for job postings and then the job posting that those folks would want to pay attention to is bus operator and then they just follow the steps go ahead and um, do everything you need to do through that online application once that is kicked into the system then they are officially part of um, that hr process so if they are moving moved forward, then they'll go ahead and, and start um, filling training classes. And, um, you know, they'll at least that's your first step is to fill out that application. Is online the only way to fill out an application or can they go someplace if they don't have can that? also um, come to the board office. We do have um, an HR specialist that works with service personnel positions. So she's very knowledgeable about um, all of the process for all of those folks that are specifically interested in a service position. Um, um, so at the board office, um, they're on 200 Elizabeth Street. And is there anything you guys would like to add in closing? I think we've covered just about everything. If there's anything else that you guys want to. I think so. I think, um, you know, amidst the frustration, I know that, you know, parents should just know that we're doing everything we possibly can and dealing with what is not just a Kanawha County Schools problem, but really a national problem. But we're not going to rush anybody through this process in order to get people behind the wheel of a bus. It's a longer process that's designed for a reason. Um, and then it just means that it hurts a little bit worse when somebody drops out or they move on because we've invested a lot of that time. But you have to invest that time um, in order to get the right people um, behind the wheel. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you guys taking the time. And hopefully we'll have opportunities to do this again in the future as they always like to stay on top of things. And, and I'm sure you guys do, too. And I think it'll hopefully make everyone feel more at ease and comfort and in the know on what's going on. And it's just not as easy as what a lot of people think <laughs> that it should be sometimes. And, and discussions like this hopefully will help um, make it easier for folks. And, and guys out there, you know, this is the way what you listeners here can do to help is encourage people to apply. You know somebody, give them the link, tell them to go down to 200 Elizabeth Street and apply for the, for the job. I think that's one way to get some help and contact your legislator. We need higher paid <laughs> bus drivers. That's one way to get that done. So appreciate you guys taking the time to talk with me today. Thanks so much. Thank you.